Hi, welcome to the Fit and Healthy Today show. And today our topic matter is inflammation. I've been seeing a lot of injuries, bumps and bruises and arthritis and all kinds of things that would lend themselves to inflammation lately. And so I thought I would specifically pick this subject matter demonstrating the, or, or illustrating the causes some dietary recommendations and then some good supplements that have university studies and research to back them up as far as being anti-inflammatories or their ability to reduce inflammatory response. First of all, when we look at inflammation, I like to look at the definition so you have a real good idea. And I know this is a little complex, but bear with me. And we know most of the symptoms of inflammation include the swelling, the redness, the pain that results from it. Um, but what we like to look at is kind of, if I can, and, and if you bear with me, the actual um, scientific explanation. Prote uh, protease, which is an enzyme, and something called bradykinins, uh, which are particles of proteins, literally get liberated in the in injured area of the region, and they interact with the actual nerve receptors, thereby causing them to go boom, boom, boom. And then the immune system responds to this inflammation, and then you get swelling. It's the body's immediate response to uh, pain, injury, trauma, or what it perceives as being a injury. Now, when we have are looking at the causes of inflammation, they are numerous, and, and we can get into a discussion about vascular inflammation, kidney inflammation, <laughs> liver inflammation, brain inflammation, and it's endless. You can have inflammation in any part of the body. But when we look to the most common causes of inflammation, we're going to look to obviously injury or trauma. We're going to look to allergies and a lot of people obviously having the um, you know, allergic reactions, the itching, the hives, things like that. Those are all inflammatory responses that the body has by this definition. Overuse of medications or the reaction to uh, or allergic reaction to medications. There are certain drugs that induce inflammatory responses like aspirin. Or I know you think in terms of NSAIDs being anti-inflammatories, but they in and of themselves can be very inflammatory, particularly to the stomach and the bowel, the brain, and the vascular system. When we look at everyday types of things that cause inflammation, we really want to look to dietary uh, issues as well as the lack of nutrition and nutrients. Um, when a diet is really rich in animal fats and very deficient in what we call um, omega-3 and 6 good fats, and there are good omega-6 fats that come from plants, these um, um, animal fats are, and they produce certain types of uh, prostaglandin response that increase the body's inflammatory response. And so if you have a diet that has, a, you know, you're eating steak and hamburgers and that on a daily or even um, three or four times a week all the time, um, or if you're eating a lot of the chips and, and the junk food that have the trans fats, a lot of processed food, the junk food, the soda, or foods that have a lot of chemicals like aspartame is extremely acidic and inflammatory by its, uh, causing by its nature, you're going to end up with inflammation. And most of the time in these particular cases, you're going to end up with vascular inflammation, which in turn causes arterial sclerosis, uh, fatty liver, oh my gosh, bowel inflammatory issues, the, the list goes on. But this is something that we can definitely do a good job at preventing. And I'll review uh, some of the diet and then the supplements that can help with that as well. Um, environmental toxins as well as free radicals. And free radicals are the things that go around. And, and I guess I could probably refer to them best as them being kind of like rust on the body. They, the body it literally ages and damages the body when these free radicals happen. And that's due to, once again, a lot of these poor diet, uh, lack of nutrition, and then the numerous amount of environmental toxins, over 3,000 that our government allows in our diet uh, or in our food. Um, when we're looking at the nutrients nowadays or the lack thereof of proper good foods, um, I would say that's probably one of the biggest responses 
to almost are the biggest causes of just about any disease. But when you're lacking uh, C and B and minerals, which are buffling agents and antioxidant vitamins, when you're lacking these nutrients, then you're going to have inflammation, not if. You're going to have it earlier on. You're going to increase risk of arthritis. All, every inflammatory and autoimmune inflammatory disease you can think of, in my personal opinion, besides genetic issues, and even those uh, involve some type of nutrient uh, deficiency, vitamin or mineral deficiency. Um, stress is a huge, huge inducer of uh, inflammatory response, particularly when the body produces certain types of uh, hormones called adrenaline and cortisol when we're under stress, which is our fight or flight response mode. And when those hormones are produced, it's kind of like battery acid to the vascular system. I mean, you get that quick response but it fries everything in its path. And if you don't have the proper nutrients and the ability for the cortisol levels to decrease in a swift manner, then I'll be doggone, you're gonna get uh, those inflammatory responses. Now, inflammation is also caused by bacterial, viral, or fungal infections. Those people who have chronic sinusitis, for example, oftentimes have uh, fungal issues and severe fungal issues in their sinus cavities. Um, when you get sinus infections, the majority of which are viral, um, you'll get inflammatory response in the nasal passages or pneumonia. Bacterial infections, you notice if you get them on the skin, the body uh, swells with inflammation and has the typical um, uh, uh, symptoms of inflammation. So uh, do building the immune system and aiding and abetting the body's ability to fight off infection other than throwing drugs at it to help you fight the infection is always the best way. Prevention is obviously worth a pound of cure. Diet, I know although it looks very easy and I tell you if you followed a diet like this along with proper supplementation of, of a good multivitamin and some C and some minerals, um, you would hardly, rarely ever see any inflammatory disorders. I'm serious. Bottom line is if you change that lifestyle in that regard, you just won't see it. Um, you know, I'm 51 and there's no, and I'm athletic and I'm difficult on my body. I work long hours, six days a week, 11, 12 hour days, and I do not have any arthritis or inflammatory issues. And if I do, I take care of them swiftly. Um, I have 20 and 30 year olds that are coming in with osteoarthritis, inflammation, cholesterol issues, blood pressure issues, which are, is tremendously caused by vascular inflammation. So. Um, if you'll follow along here, this is really, really important. Um, you want to eat a diet that is very alkaline based. And you can go online and you can look up alkaline producing foods. But if you can hit a 50 to 75% raw food diet with your fruits and vegetables and your nuts and your seeds, I'll tell you, you're going to reduce inflammation. I don't know how you could possibly have any inflammation with all those uh, nutrient dense foods. We also want fruits and vegetables with a lot of variety of color because for example like blueberries have an antioxidant and anti-inflammatory effect on the eyes and the brain, the vascular system and the, you know, the varicose veins, all those issues. Remember uh, illnesses like varicose veins are due to inflammatory uh, inflammation on, in the vascular system and the valves kind of disintegrating so you can't regulate the blood flow. So eating the variety of colors, alkaline based, and eating lower fat meats, uh, chicken breast, and I love cold water fish such as salmon, herring, and sardines. I know a lot of people go, Ugh. but if you don't like fish, then by golly, I think you should probably think about doing some fish oil or at least some um, uh, marine algae forms of DHA along with your nuts and seeds. Very important to have adequate amounts of good fats to reduce inflammation. And when I ask most parents when their kids have a lot of injuries, inflammatory responses, you know, the sprained ankles take five weeks to heal, things like that. Most of the time the kids, besides not eating many fruits and vegetables, very rarely is there any nuts or avocados or any good fats fed which help lubricate and reduce inflammation. Um, when you do have inflammation, you want to avoid a certain classification um, of foods, and they're called nightshade vegetables. 
um, a research scientist by the name of Dr. Childress at, I believe, Rutgers University discovered that 78% of Americans are nightshade sensitive. And what that means is when you have inflammation, these particular um, fruits and vegetables do not allow you to deflame. And they include tomatoes, potatoes, eggplant, peppers, and probably tomatillos as well should be added to that. If you have inflammation, you want to reduce your intake of those particular um, fruits and vegetables. Eating pineapple and papaya, those are foods that are really rich, and you eat them with your meals. They're really rich in substances called bromelain and papain, which are anti-inflammatories by nature. In addition to aiding digestion, they actually can reduce inflammation uh, if you eat these foods on a regular basis. Last but not least, you've got to drink water. And I talked about this a little bit when we talked about chronic sinusitis and lots of other most of the time I always have at the bottom of the diet portion, you've got to drink water. Remember, histamine response rises tremendously when you don't have adequate amount of moisture in the body, when it's dehydrated. So drinking water helps the body cleanse and it does decrease inflammation. It keeps the lymphatic system moving so that you can clear out too when you have infections, viral, fungal, or bacterial infections. Um, I want to go over the supplements that um, I personally um, have utilized, I think, every single one of these, and I take quite a few of them already, um, to reduce inflammation. And um, you don't have to do all of them, but there are some basic things that I do think everybody should include. That would include, when you, particularly if you have inflammation, omega-3 fatty acids. Now, if you're vegetarian, obviously you can get it from flax and nuts and seeds. Um, but if you're not and you're willing to do some of the fish oil, um, a, a tablespoon of fish oil per day really helps with the body's ability to deal with inflammation and literally, literally produces certain prost prostaglandins that reduce inflammation. You've got to have a good multivitamin, and we talked about that already. You need the extra Bs, the minerals, all the things that you're going to find in a good multi. And I'm not talking about uh, a local warehouse multivitamin made in China. It ain't going to cut it, and most of the um, surveys done on those independent lab um, workups on them, they have anywhere from a 4 to 6 percent absorption rate. So they're virtually worthless, and that doesn't count all the toxic substances coming in it, and our FDA's inability to confirm what's actually in the vitamin. Um, when you do have inflammation increasing and your B vitamins, a B50 three times a day, and then if you're noticing uh, a lot of chronic uh, tendon and ligament types of inflammatory, we add in a little bit of extra B6, which is about a 500 milligram time release. And I have handled more carpal tunnel, plantar fasciitis, where I've used that combination in combination with a product called MSM, which I don't have down here and I probably should, for reduction of inflammation. MSM is a sulfur compound that helps tissue repair. Now on an everyday basis, everybody should be doing some form of a buffered or ester C with bioflavonoids. And you know, 1,000 or 2,000 milligrams a day is probably enough in a healthy individual. But when you have inflammation, you're going to have to bump this up tremendously because the body uh, needs it in order to conduct repairs. Um, I know every plastic surgeon that I'm aware of before he cuts and dices on the face or the boobs or whatever always recommends uh, that their patients take C with some source of bioflavonoids, particularly a buffered C, in order to prevent scarring. Very important whether it's on the outside or the inside as far as scarring uh, on the joints, tendons, and ligaments and elsewhere on the body. Um, when you do have an injury, um, prolytic enzymes or bromelain or a combination thereof, and there are studies to support, they are awesome at decreasing inflammation, eating the fibrin, um, which is uh, some of the scar tissue that tends to build up around this inflamed area. And they, it, I guess, I, as I say on here, they're nature's aspirin without the side effects. Um, bromelain is also extremely anti-stroke and uh, anti-blood clot. Um, a good multi-mineral, um, and if you're taking a good multivitamin, sometimes all we need to add in is a good calcium magnesium citrate form, 
with maybe obviously two to 5,000 IUs of vitamin D, depending on where your D levels are. Uh, the multi-minerals are the minerals which used to be really rich in our fruits and vegetables, now they're gone. 75 years ago, we probably wouldn't be having this conversation, but they're buffering agents. And buffering agents reduce inflammation and alkali of the blood, so it's really important to include those minerals in your supplement regimen, whether you have inflammation or not. They're great preventers of inflammation. I have so many people come in with chronic cramping and, and that type of thing in their legs and all, and it's primarily because they're mineral deficient. And I think the National Institute of Health, a study that I read said, we only get about 40% of our magnesium from our foods. So uh, we're fairly, and magnesium helps relax muscle tissues and helps you have bowel movements and, and vaso relaxes and buffers uh, acidity, pH. So necessary part if you're a healthy individual and you want to stay without inflammation. Now, there are some actual antioxidants that you could, or some antioxidants and anti-inflammatories that have real good studies on them. And with most uh, uh, substances, or supplements, I should say, um, you have side benefits instead of side effects. Most medications, very rarely can you, rec uh, you can see any side benefits. You only see a list of side effects. Garlic, you would never think so, but garlic is a great reducer of inflammation and obviously for cholesterol and infection, and it's great for circulation. Um, ginger extract, turmeric extract, um, these can replace NSAIDs, and there's good clinical data and studies, particularly if you combine uh, turmeric with a uh, bioprene, which is like a, a black pepper extract, you can get reduction of inflammation very quickly without the side effects that you're gonna see with NSAIDs like Celebrex. Um, boswellin, very similar to turmeric. It's an Ayurvedic type of, of a herb and used in a similar dosage. Um, aloe vera juice. I have more of my arthritis sufferers or my people who inflama have inflammation in the, in, the, in the bowel, the esophagus, and the stomach that use aloe vera. It's very soothing, reduces inflammation, and I know it doesn't taste all that great, but it does work. Now, when we're talking about how the immune responds to inflammation and uh, uh, pain involving inflammation, antioxidant formulas in combination with something called beta-1,3 glucon, and I know we use this a lot to stimulate immune, but remember, immune cells respond to inflammation. So keeping good uh, dosages, for example, of beta-glucan when you're an athlete really does help aid uh, the body's response to inflammation and speed up the healing process, not just speeding up uh, your immune or helping your immune system. There are homeopathics that can also be very, very helpful as um, if you have an injury, for example, a bump or a bruise or a fall. Arnica Montana and Nux Vomica are terrific for reducing swelling, especially if you can catch it pretty quickly. I know a lot of plastic surgeons, the majority I deal with, um, send their patients in for the Arnica Montana to start taking it three days before their surgery and four days after their surgery to reduce the uh, bruising and swelling. So there are some good homeopathic remedies as well. Um, next, we're going to be moving on to the research portion of our show. There's a lot of information out there that uh, Ralph needs to get to you, so I want to give him an adequate amount of time to do it. Thank you. Hi, welcome to the research portion of our show, and with us today is Ralph Torciano. And thank you for that intro. Mm -hmm. Now first, the trivia question. What common daily beverage would you probably see on a regular basis where if you drank four cups or more would lower your risk of developing type 2 diabetes by 50%? In addition to that, for every cup you drank beyond those four cups, it would result in another 7% increase or decrease in likelihood of catching type 2 diabetes. We'll come back to that towards the end. Now first, interesting thing in Spain. 
In Spain in 2005, they had a problem with deers, especially the antlers. They were fracturing at a very high rate. And they couldn't quite figure out why the deer antlers were fracturing. Well, it turned out that there was an extremely cold winter in 2005. So what happened was these plants didn't develop enough of this one particular mineral. Now, the interesting aspect about this is this led to another hypothesis in regards to osteoporosis. The reason being is you know calcium, even though an important component of bone, doesn't seem to make a difference in regards to osteoporosis that greatly. However, they especially with deers because they were consuming tons of calcium in the diet. But during that exceptionally cold winter in Spain in 2005, those plants did not develop enough of one mineral called manganese. Now here is where it comes in. And this is where they come. This is printed in the latest issue of Frontiers of uh, Bioscience Journal. All right, they found that the manganese itself is responsible for calcium actually sticking to the bone, which is extremely important. They said, the, they said, quote, the origin of osteoporosis cannot be directly linked to the lack of calcium, but rather to the lack of a mineral essential to calcium absorption. And they, this is what their hypothesis was, is that when the human body absorbs less manganese, or when it is sent from the skeleton to other organs that require it, such as the brain, the calcium is then extracted at the same time it is not properly absorbed and is excreted in the urine. How many people come in and say, hey, you know what, my calcium levels in my urine are extremely high, but yet I have osteoporosis. I'm sure a lot of doctors out there, as whether healthcare practitioners, have heard that. Well, this may be the one key element. And this came again out of basically the aspect of deer antler. Now, they also found out too, in case of Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and dementia, the brain always prioritizes manganese because it requires more of it. And then what happens is when they don't get enough manganese, there's not enough manganese to go into the bone. Henceforth, those people tend to be more prone to osteoporosis. Not because the lack of calcium, but because the lack of the glue required for calcium to stick to the bone. Manganese. Not to be confused with magnesium. Very interesting study that just came out. Now, talking about omega-3 fatty acids once again. Well, this we kind of knew in the health industry for quite some time, but it was finally confirmed. And this was published in the Journal of Neuroscience just recently. What they discovered is that the omega-3s obviously are essential for repairing nerve injury, more so than any surgical technique can do. They said these nerves have the ability to regenerate, but despite advances in surgical techniques, patients usually only have a good recovery when the injury is minor. Well, they looked at the sciatic nerves in mice, primarily, and they found that high levels of omega-3 fatty acids help the mice recover from a sciatic nerve injury more quickly and more fully, and that their muscles were less likely to waste following nerve damage. They also concluded, more work is needed, but our research indicates that omega-3 fatty acids can protect damaged nerve cells, which is the first critical step in neurological recovery. Something to think about people who complain about nerve pain, neuropathy, and a lot of other things. Look at the omega-3 intake in your diet. It may be a real simple fix in a way of avoiding a lot of pain and heartache later on. Now, going to the other side of the coin, statins. Well, if you're a smoker and you're taking statins, you may want to talk to your doctor about a certain aspect. Well, the irony about statins and smokers is that statins seem to really do a massive job in the lung of smokers, lungs of smokers, especially something called interstitial lung abnormalities. They found that there was addition, there was association between statins and the use in ILAs, we found interstitial lung abnormalities, in humans. We demonstrated that statin administration aggravated lung injury and fibrosis in what they call bleomyosin treated mice. But the has been shown to induce lung inflammation and fibrosis. Where is this printed? The American Thoracic Societies or the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine. What they discovered after they adjusted for all figures, other medications, diet, weight, the whole lineup, they discovered that it was associated with a 60% increase of your odds 
of developing interstitial lung abnormalities. Mm. Isn't that ironic? You give up, you know, to basically smoking and statins will basically cause you to almost knock your lungs right out. So generally what they said, it's not a class of even a type of statin. They found that it's just statins, period. The more water soluble the statin, the easier to absorb, the greater the damage it induces. So that's something to keep in mind. Now, fixated on the story of statins. Now we go to another issue, especially for postmenopausal females in statins. And this way, statins are just going to bash left and right. You're not going to find it on the news, but I seriously recommend you research it on your own. This is from the Archives of Internal Medicine of the JAMA Archive Journal, published online. Postmenopausal women in statins don't go good, especially when it comes to diabetes. They found that it significantly increased your risk of diabetes. And this was after looking at, in 2000, 2005, 153,840 women. After three years, 10,242 new cases of type 2 diabetes developed, way above the norm. Again, published in the Archives for Internal Medicine. And they said, did keeping with these findings of other studies, our results suggest that statin-induced diabetes mellitus is a medication class effect also, and is not related to the potency or to the individual statin, meaning just taking it in any potency is going to rise, raise your risk of diabetes or type 2 diabetes. It's about the risk to benefit ratio. If the risks do not outweigh the do not outweigh the benefits, or the risks do outweigh the benefits, I should say, really consider another venue of option with your doctor. All right. Now, I have to wrap it up real fast here. Something to be found as effective as Prozac or Torfinel, or otherwise known as Imipramine. Guess what it is? Curcurum. Curcurum was been found to be equally as effective as Prozac and Torfinel. Believe the reason why this was published in the Actifal Pulp Pharma is that the, the theory is that the antidepressant activity could be due to an increase in serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine levels in the brain. Mm -hmm. There is one specific form of curcurum called BCM. Turmeric only is about 2 to 3% uh, curcurum. If you, you know, so for a gram of turmeric, you only get a 2 to 3, you know, small amount of uh, curcuminoids in there. But otherwise, I'm being told I got to wrap it up. Back to the curiosity question. It was coffee. For every four cups of coffee you drink, your chance of type 2 diabetes is reduced by 50%. Why? Because it stops this protein folding called human islet amyloid polypeptides. And that's what it is. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ralph. Appreciate it. Thank you for joining our show. Once again, do your research and take care of your health. Thank you.